Welcome. I'm going to share my screen here uh, shortly. Thank you everybody for coming today to this training. I think it's a very important one uh, here at GitLab and really any company. Uh, we always start off with GitLab that everybody can contribute, but we can really go a step further to make sure that we are making sure that everybody's included and that we're ensuring that we appreciate, respect, and validate ideas from all different perspectives from people regardless of their background. So for day, today, my, the goal of the discussion today is to really set a baseline of why we're focusing on diversity, explore some of what we've done so far, and it'd be great to get some participation in this in terms of what you may have all done so far on your teams, uh, discuss what might get in our way, and that's when we really get to implicit bias, and then broaden our efforts for inclusion and generate ideas about what we might do differently as a team. So the great news is here at GitLab, diversity is already a value and inclusion is already very important. So you can read more about that in our values, but I'm pretty sure and hopeful you are all aware of this. So why is diversity important? I hope that you have seen stats similar to this in your careers or in your past, but there is evidence that diverse teams actually are more effective, uh, lead to better morale, greater commitment, teamwork, collaboration, better innovation and ideas, uh, and, and better capturing of markets and market share. So there's really not a downside in, in, it in terms of business health. Now, these are numbers and these are stats, but I think that diversity is important for a lot more reasons that are a little less measurable. And that really is that we are all human beings on this earth and we all deserve to be treated with respect. And we all deserve to have our ideas be heard regardless of our backgrounds. Uh, let me try something here. If I go out of screen sharing mode, can someone comment on whether or not you still see it large or if it's small? I personally can see it still. Okay, I just want to check because when I'm in screen sharing mode, I can't see any comments or anything. So I wanted to um, get smaller. Okay, so. Uh, this is where I open this up to more of you, and I know that we're typically typing in comments, but feel free to unmute as well and share your experiences that you've had here with GitLab. What have you tried thus far for diversity and inclusion on your teams? What tips might you have? Um, and what didn't work, and why do you think it didn't work if you have tried something that you didn't find to, to get you the results that you wanted? Uh, anyone willing to share and open up here? No? Does that mean we haven't had any efforts today in terms of, I know that we've done sponsorships of events for women in tech. We've done sponsorships in different categories there around diversity. Is there, maybe you draw out opinions of people who are quiet on your team and aren't usually the ones who speak up, but if probed, maybe they would. Is there um, any thoughts there? Yeah, so, give me Barbie, you're asking about diversity and inclusion or just diversity? Diversity and inclusion. Both are, both are important. You can't have diversity without inclusion. Okay, so um, somehow in my head, always when I hear diversity, it kind of relates to, you know, uh, color of your skin, whether you're male or female and so on. So I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble um, uh, getting that um, tied to my team, uh, we tried doing hiring, um, like posting um, um, jobs to the job boards that uh, cater specifically to women in tech. Uh, we got, I think, total of five applicants over a period of a year. Um, it could be just because this uh, specific uh, job is, well, it's actually very specific. We, don't, we didn't have that many uh, applicants anyway. Um, but um, um, that's basically where, where, where we stopped with trying, um, you know, increasing the, that sort of diversity. Um, but when it comes to diversity of opinions or, uh, or inclusion uh, of, of the, the team uh, that, uh, that they currently have, um, I've been trying to put people on the spot, which is not the nicest thing, but it actually gets them to 
um, um, out of their comfort zone and uh, for the past, I would say like six months, doing that has helped uh, me get more out of everyone on the team. And um, now I have a situation where a junior can speak up and uh, everyone else will uh, really appreciate their opinions. Um, also, um, the, the, the contribution that everyone is making is um, not valued with their job title. It's actually valued with the contribution. How much uh, does that actually get GitLab um, 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 some um, value, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But that's basically as much as, uh, as I did um, when it comes to this. It, it is still to me completely unclear how to uh, increase, well, both diversity and in inclusion in, uh, in mm -hmm. my case. Okay, great. And we'll go into some tips and suggestions that I might have um, later in the presentation or just some things to be aware of. But um, it is interesting for me to hear what has been on your minds up until now and, and things that you might've been doing to try to be actually thoughtful about this instead of um, just letting it play out however it plays out without actually putting effort and thought into it. So it's, it's um, this is one of those things that we'll get into later in the presentation too, but we, we all do have biases and uh, we can try to ignore that or we can acknowledge that and then get better at combating those to make sure we're making the right decision for the right reasons but we'll get we'll get further into that as we as we move here so i've put i have a few slides in here on our current stats um, for diversity however i also want to be clear to me that this discussion is not about just about numbers and about trying to change numbers it actually um, I want to change the way we we think about these things, and I want to ensure that we are thoughtful when we're just talking with people. We're a very, very global company, and we have people from a lot of different countries, and diversity means something different um, depending on where you live and where you're from, and um, interactions, and um, what is perceived as normal or standard is different in different countries and so we really do have a lot of emphasis here not on just underrepresented minorities that are typically discussed in the u.s but also just in making sure that we are um equally respectful of opinions regardless of what accent they're being communicated in regardless of if the grammar is perfect in our typing in english um, regardless of what country we're from and that we're, we're putting thought into those things. So I'm sharing the numbers, but I don't want you to think that that's all I am focused on uh, or all that I think that GitLab should be focused on. However, with that being said, I would love to see better numbers here too. Um, we are a global company. We can hire from anywhere. So to me, we should be um, completely free to not be bound by some of the traditional things that get in the way of companies hiring really device, diverse workforces. Uh, so uh, we, uh, including, including women. So a lot of the stats that you'll see quoted tend to revolve around females and versus males with diversity. That's one reason for that is, is there's a lot of good use cases for that. And we're in the tech industry and the tech world. And when you consider that women are over half the population, you do have to question why they're so low in tech and and open source in those areas. And you do have to, it does give you pause to just, why is that? Um, and it's a group that because they are over half the population, it's easy to use as examples of there could be a problem, right? So when I, if, when I later in this presentation focus on some stats around that, it's not just because I am a woman, but it is because it's a very glaring, obvious problem in the tech world that um, we do have low numbers of females um, entering the tech world and we have a high number of females exiting the tech world uh, compared to their male counterparts. So just some more stats here. I'm just kind of leaving these up for now um, to have you guys take a quick look at them. So, so I had one thought on the, on the diversity. Um, and, and the hiring side of things, um, 
one of the things I noticed, GitLab has a lot of very specialty job descriptions. And this means that the, the pool of diversity candidates that could do a job is shrunk even more. And I feel like, you know, looking at the places that I've worked before, um, the, the more general the job description and the less specific, the more likely you're going to get diversity applicants into those job pools. Uh, and, and also that just even, even me personally, I've found that uh, uh, I don't want to hire for my team somebody that is so super specialized uh, that can't learn anything new, where I want to just, I just want to hire a, a good person and, and get them in my team and, and get them uh, to perform on my team without having to like uh, have a specialty ahead of time. Like if I had gone into my last job with the job requirement was I was a MySQL database engineer, I would have never gotten hired because I was not a MySQL database engineer when I started, but I became that as part of the job. And I've, you know, on, on the list of reasons that, that I, you know, I've, when, when I was working at the, uh, you know, listening to the, um, the reasons for, uh, for diversity candidates not applying is that they see a job requirement and they don't apply at all. Uh, mm -hmm. so I, I think if we made our, if we, if we cut down the number of job descriptions and just said, we have software engineers, uh, or instead of specialty, specialty, specialty software engineer, we would get a better pool of candidates. And once we hire them, then we can figure out what team they can go on and where they can actually perform. Okay, that's a, that's a very interesting perspective, and that's one that we can talk about as a recruiting team and talk about with you when we're helping you hire for your teams and, and something we can probably experiment with here. So Abby's taking notes for me, so um, hopefully we got that one taken. Um, I, I do have, I agree with Ben, absolutely. There is one thing to keep in mind, though. Um, if you uh, cast a very wide net, uh, you have to account for the time of uh, ramp up, right? And we do not have that time. Um, for most cases, I did exactly, Ben, what you said. I hired a couple of just engineers with some experience in the, in the fields, but not too much. And uh, compared to people who had experience, um, they take significantly more time to get into, into, into the line of uh, what we need. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be keep, kept in mind, I think. Yeah, there's definitely some downsides to that. It also increases the time to recruit because you end up having a whole lot of people you have to weed through given the lack of specificity and the people applying who aren't qualified. So there is there's downsides, but it doesn't mean that it's not something we could experiment and try within certain roles. And it doesn't mean there's not certain opportunities for us to bring in people with less experience that we can train. It's kind of like the it, concept it's around not, the internship. It's, it's not about less experience. Mm -hmm. It's about less specific experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that the the not not we want to hire like we want to hire smart people. Uh, we want to hire good quality uh, people, and it's not a it's not a, it's it's about removing the checkbox barrier, mm -hmm. uh, not the not the bar for for hiring. Good, good. Um, and I, I agree with you that there can be very experienced people that don't have a specific experience um, in a certain area, um, but there would be some training involved in that and to getting that experience that they need. But if they're smart yeah. and they're quick, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and so I think and, it's and a I great suggestion. And I them for years and years. Yeah, yeah. So I think by, I think by giving it's, them interesting problems. Yeah, I think it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, so if we are, if we, if we lead through GitLab's value, won't that ensure that we're diverse and inclusive? So you would like to think so, but unfortunately each of us in this world and on this call come with baggage and, and, and come with our own experiences. Um, and so implicit bias does affect our perceptions and our behaviors, whether we want it to or not. And the reason it's called implicit is because it, it's not something we're consciously making a decision about. Very few people when they engage in um, selective behavior that disadvantages a certain group of people are doing that purposely. 
there might be some of those people out there. I hope I don't know any of them, but most of us are doing it um, subconsciously if we're doing it. And that's really where implicit bias comes from. Some bias is necessary. We have a million pieces of information coming to us all at once. Our brains can only deal with 40 at a time. So we do have pre-established filters and lenses and perceptions and interpretations and preferences that help us to keep ourselves safe. You know, if, if you're driving in a car, there's only so much you can process with all the other cars around you. So how are you gonna make the decisions when you see someone skid off? You, you have some instincts, right? And those instincts um, have been ingrained in every living being on this planet, not just humans, um, since we've been on this planet. And it's normal and it's not something we should be ashamed of. Uh, but biases can be harmful. And there are some different types of biases that um, we do need to work on. And I've listed a few here, performance and attribution, confidence and likability versus likability, attractiveness and figures, physical stature, stereotype threat, and group think are some examples of this. And we'll go through some of these in more detail. And then if you have questions at the end about what I mean by some of these, I can address those, but some of those questions will be answered as we go through. I know that these are kind of probably terminologies for this that you're not necessarily used to hearing. Um, so you guys did some pre-work to take some tests and uh, we won't discuss those in detail because I want to make sure we leave lots of time for questions and things. But I would be interested in learning, did anyone, was anybody surprised at all in some of the tests they took and some of the results they got and might be willing to talk about that? I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I took um, a religion test. I took a test uh, for uh, recognition of Asian Americans versus uh, foreign. And then, oh God, what was the other one? I took three. Um, but the, I was actually really surprised at the religion one um, because it came up that I'm slightly biased or I show a slight preference for Judaism over Christianity, but I'm an atheist. So I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, not to discuss religion, but I mean, it was the test that I took. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So I found that interesting. Yeah. It's always a little scary to get to this topic, right? Because no one wants to admit when they've got a bias. The important thing to understand here is though, if the test said you had a bias, it doesn't mean you're discriminating against anybody. You could very much be overcoming these biases, right? Um, it just it just helps us understand that we do have them, and so we actually might need to be thoughtful about overcoming them. But admitting that you have a bias isn't admitting that you have a problem with the way you treat people. Um, you may, it may mean that, but it also may mean that you're completely overcoming that. And um, if you're already been aware of it, then you know to be more thoughtful about it. I have some biases that I don't always want to admit. And um, I'll admit one here that I'm uncomfortable because I don't want to offend anyone, but we all feel that way. Uh, I have um, a strong bias toward um, non-smoking, a strong preference towards non-smoking versus smoking. And I have to make sure when I meet someone who smokes that I'm not judging them on that. I'm not judging their intelligence on that. I'm not judging their ability to do work. And so I have to really hold myself responsible for not, um, not treating people differently or assuming things about them if they're smoking a cigarette. And that, that's one of my things. And I have to do that very consciously. Um, and I don't know why that is. I, it might be because I was raised in the first county in America to make it illegal to smoke in public or in, in, indoors. And so from a very, very young age, that's been really bred into me. And so I have to overcome that. And a lot of us have biases that have been bred into us at a very young age, depending on the way our parents thought about things or the way that our communities thought about things. And so it's, it's good when we can recognize that and try to overcome it. I thought that biases often, am I right in that biases are often things that you don't know? Biases are often things you don't know that you have, right? Yeah, so that's you why the tests are. You have a bias against smokers. 
how did I figure it out? Yeah, did you take a test and they I did, you? I did. Oh. Part of it, was, that's an easy one for me because it's a strong one. Usually if you have a very, very, very strong bias, you can start to, you, you start to be um, consciously aware of it. Um, the subconscious ones can be more dangerous because you're not aware of it. And uh, I've got some of those biases as well. I, I did one of the tests on um, accents. And now that I've been made aware of it, it feels obvious to me. But before I took the test, I didn't realize that I give more credibility to an English accent than I do an American one. Um, and, um, and so that was something that I had to be like, okay, just because you're speaking with an English accent, I can't just assume you're the expert. <laughs> and, 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 and it seems obvious to me now, but when I took the test, I was like, what? Um, so there, there are things that are, that are more, more uh, unconscious. And then I also will admit that when I took the test on the Asian Americans versus non, I did have a preference towards Asian Americans for math and science and engineering. And that's not one that I was conscious of either. And that's not one that I'm necessarily proud to admit, but it is one that according to the test I have, it was a slight preference. It wasn't extreme. That's probably why it wasn't as noticeable to me about it. Uh, but again, it has, it means that I have to be really careful if I'm interviewing candidates to make sure that I'm not assuming someone isn't just as able in those areas or that I give um, the wrong attribution for um, skills. I was on the airplane back from Crete and I was sitting next to a man from India who worked for UC Berkeley. And he was telling me that when he tells people that he works for UC Berkeley, everybody asks him the first question, oh, are you in IT? And they just assume that he must be in the tech area and he's not, he's in finance. Um, but people make the assumption about him because he's an Indian American that he's in IT. Uh, it doesn't upset him, but it's a bias that people have uh, in, in great masses. So, and, uh, and so, yeah, so it can be, you know, some of these things are, are really hard to admit, but at least admit them to yourself. If you can't admit them to a broad group or a broad audience, that's okay but at least admit them to yourself so you can hold yourself accountable for trying not to do it and for overcoming it. Um, if you can't, if you want to sit there and tell yourself that you have no biases, you can do that. But I really fundamentally believe you're lying to yourself. I, I really do think we all have these things and we can either accept it and do better, or we can put our head in the sand and never get better. And I'd rather have us all get better. Um, yep. So moving on. Uh, this was generally in the stats that of uh, people who take these tests, and I pulled these stats a while ago, so some of these percentages may have changed if we pulled them again today. I pulled them probably almost a year ago, but uh, they're, I'm, I'm guessing they stayed pretty consistent. So you can read here that you know 76% more readily associate males with career and females with family. Um, I know a lot of women who've taken this test and the women do this too. This isn't just men who do this. <laughs> women also attribute women more to family and men to career. Um, and so you can, you can take a look at some of the other stats here before I switch. Do any of these stats surprise anybody? I, um, my wife is a surgeon and I am not a surgeon. And when we go to these surgical parties in there, or whatever it is, when they don't know that she's a surgeon, everybody always assumes that I am the doctor and that she's, is never, ever, ever happened that they have assumed that she is the doctor, ever. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it? Yeah, and people always, for some, for some reason, I always get asked if I'm a doctor. Elsewhere too, I don't know. And, she, and when she's in the hospital, everybody always assumes she's a nurse because she's four foot 11 and, uh, you know, she's a tiny person, um, so everybody mm -hmm. always says to her, excuse me, nurse. And they also always address the doctor, the male doctors with doctor, and they always address her as Tiffany. So this is like a big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, when I was on international assignment in Europe um, 10 years ago, and people would say, oh, you're Americans living in Germany. Um, your husband must have got transferred. Your husband must be an expat. It never could possibly be that I was given the expat opportunity, which is exactly what the case was. Everyone assumed it was I was following my husband, um, and uh, and so these things are these things are real, and, and it it's it's you know it's 
the reality that we're living in. So selection bias. Um, there are some interesting experiments, tests, changes that people tried to make and measured the in, impact of those. So a study showed that the women's odds of being selected for a U.S. orchestra increased by 50% when they did blind auditions. So that means there was a screen up, the evaluators, um, all they could hear was the music and not see the person. And suddenly they selected 50% more women. Uh, that's pretty dramatic to me. That, that's an area that you can pretty clearly, it's pretty black and white in terms of there's not a lot of factors. You know, in a resume, you could say you had PTA on there, you had Boy Scouts on there. And so even though you didn't see the name, you could still assume a gender. <clears throat> At SoundCloud, we went to um, uh, because uh, a couple of the, because SoundCloud is a music company. Uh, several of the people in the diversity group, including my partner, uh, were musicians and knew about this. So we convinced the recruiters at at SoundCloud to do blind uh, resume screens, mm -hmm. uh, and this was super super great to to have them go through the little extra effort to 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 have all the resumes screen, which is especially hard in Europe because they include photos and other family history. So they had to go and scrub mm -hmm. that stuff as well. Yeah, um, it is hard yeah, to do. We've talked about doing it on our team and it, it is hard. It's not- It is, it's it is not hard, easy. but it, it, yeah. it was extremely successful at SoundCloud. Oh, good, that's good. So maybe we'll reach out to you offline and talk about how we might be able to try something like that here. We're, we're at a little bit of a, how would we do this phase? Um, so it could be interesting to get your input on that. And that gets to the next one. Identical resumes, one with a man's name, the other with a woman's name. 70% of applicants with man's names versus 49% with female names were considered a worthy hire. Exact same resumes. Uh, so it's it's interesting to me that, you know, that this, these biases still exist. I, I like to tell myself with the focus on diversity now in tech, it could be an advantage to have a female's name um, because people are trying to increase diversity. So when I see that it's still a problem, even though, it feels to me when I talk to the industry, everyone's trying to get better at this, and yet we still have this problem. Um, so it's 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 a little deflating for me, but I, I believe that if we work really hard, we can do better. Um, they also found that um, names that are traditionally in America, Caucasian sounding names got more calls for interviews than those with black sounding names. I know personally, I've been told at least five times in my life that I got the interview because of my name. and they it, it was just as sexist really but they wanted to see what barbie looked like and so when they saw barbie on the resume they decided to bring me in so um probably a different reason than the the what race it sounded like but not any better really uh so um performance attribution so a study showed that when men and women working on tasks together women were given less credit for a successful outcome and blamed for more failure um, they also, when a female raises an idea, they get interrupted or ignored more when just a few minutes later, a man can have the exact same idea and everyone says, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, and they also found that um, success in groups were often attributed to um, potentials and smarts. So by in groups means the majority group um, and versus the out group was luck or hard work versus actually deserving it, um, which the in group got. I need to go back and put the source of this in there. I'm sorry that that's missing. Um, so, and then the confidence versus likability and the maternal bias. So this is, this is really an issue and it really is kind of a catch 22, which is what we mean by a double bind. So there was a Harvest Business Review case. Um, Heidi and Howard were equally competent. Uh, Howard is likable, Heidi not so much. Women are expected to be nice, communal, warm, Men are expected to be assertive, action oriented and decisive. When a woman displays more of those traits, we tend to use words like abrasive, pushy, demanding, self-promoting, selfish. Uh, and, and, um, and then if resumes have things like PTA on them, then you're less likely to get hired or promoted and, uh, and, and less salary. However, if a woman is, who is a mother is not seen at warm and nurturing, then they're even more disliked because they're supposed to be for their families. Women also research have shown to get judged more if they don't have kids and they, and society feels they should. It, it's kind of like a, 
what you're not nurturing, you're not kind, you don't want to start a family that's, you know, and, and, and they'll get, they'll get judged for having the kids and then they'll get judged for not having the kids. And they're in this kind of like catch 22. Can I do anything right? Um, and, uh, it can, it can be very frustrating. We had an incident at a previous company where, uh, we had a female engineer. She was an amazing engineer, one of the best that we had. And she had a child and she went on maternity leave. And while she was on leave, her manager changed. So she came back to a new manager. So she comes to work uh, after returning from maternity leave. At this company, maternity leave is very rich. And so she came back kind of in a part-time basis um, to integrate for the first month. And then she came back full-time after that. So it was her intent to be part-time. She came in, the manager sat her down and said, I've really heard a lot of great things about your work. So she was happy. She's like, oh, great. He likes me. He, he thinks I'm great. Uh, and then he said, however, I'm really disappointed to hear that you decided to start a family. I purposely have not had kids because I wanted to build my career. And you really could have been something here if you had just taken that same route. And she kept her mouth shut and she didn't say anything, but she went home and told her husband, I can't return part-time. I need to return full-time. I need to see that I need my manager to see I'm still committed to my career. I need him to see I'm still focused and prioritized on that. So she did that. And then she started working later hours. And again, she told nobody about what I think is a very inappropriate comment. And, uh, and she showed up to work and, and she stayed later than usual. And so it was after five or six and, and the other engineers were, who were all male were in a bullpen and they were all working hard on their work. And she walks in and they're all, wow, you know, you're still here. Um, we'll call her Susan. Susan, you're still here. And uh, Susan said, yeah. Barbie, one, one interruption. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to confirm that the the acronym PTA in here is Parent Teacher. Yes, Parent Teacher Association. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a lot of male friends who are the presidents of their PTA groups, but uh, it still seems to be more associated with women. Uh, so um, he said, "What are you doing here so late?" And she said, "Well, working like the rest of you." And he said, "Well, after five o'clock, we get a little bit raunchy. So if you can't hang with the boys, you should go home." So. What's upsetting to me about this is not just that the manager said really inappropriate things, but that none of the guys in that bullpen spoke up and said, whoa, hold on, Mr. Manager. She has every right to be here, and we shouldn't be saying things that aren't appropriate, and we want her to stay. No, they all put their heads down and kept quiet. And that's what I don't want to see happening here at GitLab. If you see something, say something. You are leaders, you are managers, it was your, it's your responsibility. But I would like every employee to do that, even if they're not a manager. Because when these things happen, sometimes the person in the out group, the person who doesn't feel welcome, the person who feels like the major, minority, doesn't feel powerful enough to speak up for themselves. And so it comes to a point where when we see wrongs happening, we need to be the ones who stick up for those wrongs. Not because we need to defend the poor, weakless, weak creature, but because it's the right thing to do. And we need to show that we're all empowered to do so. And, and we need to get everyone going in the right direction on the right step. So, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of passionate about that. So we, we get into um, attractiveness and physical stature. You probably have seen the shows where they put someone in a suit that makes them look, like, look, look less attractive than they really are. And suddenly they get worse service and uh and and people ignore them more well in in the u.s less than 15 percent of american men are over six feet tall but nearly 60 percent of all corporate ceos are over six feet tall uh less than four percent of americans are over six two and yet 36 percent of ceos are over six two so there clearly is some bias towards the way people look and how tall they are at least for men as well that could exist for women. I don't have the stats for it, but you mentioned your wife, Jacob, being 4'11". Um, I don't know if that's true for women as well, but it certainly is for, for men. And there were also changes in salary and things too. So uh, it, it's interesting to me that, I, and I'm sure that no one knows that, presidential candidates now are put on podiums so they're all equal height during the debate because they found also during presidential debates if one was higher or shorter, then we tended to vote for the tall president. And so they ended up trying to make them all look the same to, to take away that bias. Uh, so where does implicit bias show up at work? It can show up in the resume stage, the interviewing stage. It can show up in work assignments. It can show up in promotions. 
um, and that gut instinct feeling. I will tell you, it can also show up in pay. Um, and not just in the way you're thinking about, it shows up in pay because we're perpetrating the crimes of the past. Let's put it that way. So if you interview someone who has been discriminated against in their entire career, so their pay isn't as good and their opportunities aren't as good, and then you pay them based off what they're currently making or their current opportunity instead of their potential and their market value, um, then you continue to perpetuate that discrimination. You, 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 you dot, you're not the one making the change. We saw that a lot at Netflix. We hired a lot of lawyer, entertainment lawyers, and it tended to be that the, the people of color who were applying for these roles were being paid a lot less than everybody else who was applying for the roles. So we could have done the thing that a lot of companies do of just, okay, you're making this, well, I'll pay you that. Um, or we could say, you're making this, but I just hired five other people doing the exact same job at this rate, so I'm moving you up there too. And, and that's the kind of thing that you start, you have to be careful about that you're not just going off of someone's um, opportunities and privileges in the past instead of their potential and aptitude in the future. Um, let's go on. So some things that we hear at work that, uh, can be damaging and can show bias, um, does not join meetings in a shirt and tie. I've seen this in, in both ways. I've seen people show up to an interview too dressed up. So they don't want to hire them because they think they're too fancy. And I've seen people come in with flip flops and cargo shorts and they say, oh, they're not respectful. Uh, we shouldn't hire them. I've seen it. I've seen it go in, in both directions too polished or not too polished. I've seen this a lot and I've seen this already here at GitLab. We interviewed someone for my team who had a lot of experience. She was very skilled. They didn't use too polished. They used, she sounded too corporate. So she was very polished. She was very articulate and that came across as sounding too corporate and then thus maybe not a good fit for GitLab. Uh, her, her um, experience was both startup and corporate, but she was very, very polished in the way she spoke. My old boss had this problem. No one thought she was genuine because she was too polished and it felt it sounded too rehearsed. And so when she spoke, no one actually saw the truth and the, and the passion behind it because they thought it was just all rehearsed act. Uh, so 20 more has, has too much experience. So they're overqualified and that can be discriminatory as well. Just because I have a lot of experience doesn't mean I'm not willing to get my hands dirty and do the hard work. But sometimes we look at people, we make that assumption about them. Has, has or has not attended certain schools. I love that this isn't a problem at GitLab. I have been at companies that will only recruit from 20 universities across the world and they have to be the top ones. And if you're not there, you don't get hired. Um, so I love that, that GitLab doesn't have that problem so much. There might still be people here who do, who see a certain school and think, wow, you went to MIT, I gotta get you. Um, but I think generally we actually look at people's abilities here. Um, the strong or wrong accent, talks too much or doesn't talk enough, um, won't be able to push back, I hear a lot, um, does or doesn't have children, and then not a culture fit. So I think being a culture fit is super, super important. But if you're evaluating people on culture fit, you have to evaluate them on each of our values. And you have to be arti able to articulate why they don't match our values. I don't ever want to inter hear you interview feedback where I just hear, not a culture fit, I want to know why. I want to know based on what. Uh, and if you hear that from anyone on your interview team, if you're a hiring manager and you hit, if you get feedback that's just not a culture fit, you need to probe too. Why not? What did you ask and what was the answer that made you feel that way? Um, you re we really need to dig into that to, to fight against that generality that really is, is not helpful. Barbara, can um, I ask you about one specific? Sure. Can you go back a slide, please? will not be able to push back. Why is that listed as um, a not a uh, good thing? I why don't is understand. it listed as not a good thing? So yeah. you don't understand why people would want people who push back? No, the other way. Why, why, would, uh, why not reject people who are not able to uh, um, fight for their cause, if I, if I can put okay. it that way? So, yeah, so I think that that's another um, very culturally dangerous one. So depending on where you are from or your past experiences, you will be more comfortable 
um, demonstrably pushing back than others. And also in an interview setting, it can be really difficult to feel really comfortable doing that. And their people are just going to have different comfort levels. I know a lot of people that are perceived as not pushing back that absolutely do push back, but they do it in a more private setting or a private way or a, a gentler way, perhaps. Uh, and not in a way that they're really going to get credit for pushing back, but a way that is still just as effective. Uh, and so I think it's just a matter, especially a global company like we are here at GitLab, not everybody is going to push back in the same way. You know, direct looks different in Amsterdam than it does in Japan. And I said this at the summit, right? And so we just have to be careful that we're not overvaluating, overvaluing that. Uh, and it's different for different roles. And, and, and things. I think when you get to um, leadership levels, you would expect even in an interview for people to, you know, have some strong opinions around things. But um, we just have to be careful that we're not making that as a, a, a judgment based off of culture or background, but we're actually being thoughtful about whether or not they really will push back in their way that's effective for them and effective for the company. And uh, I'll add to what Barbie said, in addition to the, the cultural differences here, this is very common when English is spoken as a second language, regardless of culture. So it's something we have to be careful of as well. Yeah, yeah. And that was one of the things that we found, we were talking about the live stream video and how to make it better. We also found that for a lot of people who weren't native English speakers, they were much less comfortable participating in that than people who felt comfortable speaking English. And that's, those are just not things we want to have affecting our, our employees' experiences here, our teammates' experiences here. Thanks. So um, I pretty much have said all this already, but it's on a slide so you can refer back to it. <laughs> and so discussion. So how do we feel, I might actually skip this. I think discussion is good, but we haven't gotten to some of the other slides in here. So. I will go back to this slide if we have time because we only have 20 minutes left. So I apologize for that. So diversity looks more like this. You've got all the different colors in the, in the Crayola crayon box. But inclusion is when you can actually draw a beautiful picture with those things. It doesn't help to hire in people from different backgrounds, different races, different genders. If when we get here, when they get here, we don't use everyone we have to paint the beautiful picture, right? Uh, if we put them in our corner and we leave them in the box, that doesn't, that, that's not inclusive. That doesn't actually help. And not only will you not get their great ideas and perspectives, but you also won't get them referring their friends. Uh, if I think it's terrible to be a woman at GitLab, then you better believe that I'm not going to tell my other female friends that they should work here. And uh, so it, it also is also important for the pipeline in the future. So inclusion means access, respect, and value. So regardless of where you're from, regardless of your background, you have the equal access to information, projects, ideas, teams, functions, as everybody else. When you participate in those things, you'll be respected just as much as anybody else. And you will be valued on the same dimensions that we're, we're placing and valuing and determining the value of others. It will be on your work. It'll be on your contributions. You will be just as able to contribute and work and it won't be on how you look or how you sound. And there's some more notes in there. I'm kind of going fast now. There is a power dynamic. So I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'm in the minority, I don't feel represented, and I'm uncomfortable speaking up. I'm the only one who seems to think or feel this way, so maybe I'm wrong. I feel uncomfortable confronting the leader. There's been a lot of times in my career that I should have spoken up about things that were being done to me. And I kept my mouth shut and moved forward because I didn't want to be the problem causer. I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to be that over emotional woman. Um, those were all disservices to my colleagues um, who could have learned from my perspective and my opinion and my experiences. It was a disservice to every other woman who was going to be in the workplace after me. And I've had to really push myself to be someone who will speak up and will be quote annoying. Um, when I, when I, I try to help other people see when their, their behavior is not inclusive uh, and maybe not making people feel welcome. And I would hope that all of you would feel the same freedom to do. So what can we do as leaders uh, before, during, after these situations um, where you're seeing it? So 
Um, this is this is advice to you. We're going to be rolling out the harassment prevention training that's legally required in the U.S., but we're going to roll it out globally because it's good for us all to have an equal understanding of that, given that we're one company. Uh, but this is a, a quick, uh, maybe advice thing, but you might hear much of the same in that training. Um, so again, recognize that you have biases, identify yours, try to become conscious of them so they don't rule you. Uh, question your gut instincts and notice what's influencing your decisions regarding people. So if you get, for example, on an interview with someone and you immediately have a reaction, whether it be positive or negative, really check why am I having that reaction? Is it based off of the facts or is it based off of some bias I might have? Note your first impressions. And this is something we can do just as we're walking around, right? So not just taking a test, but if you're walking around town one night and you, you walk by lots of people, try to just make a note in your mind about how you react when you see people uh, that look different, dress different, sound different, and see if, see if there might be some biases there that, that might exist. Do you, do you have a pattern um, when, you see, when you see people? And then consider talking about what factors might be contributing to a less inclusive environment on your team. So you can all go back to your teams and have a discussion with them about what's working, what's not working, do they all feel valued? Uh, we have the results of the employee survey coming out soon, so you'll get some information from those too. But uh, it's, it's good to just kind of foster the discussion and make the whole team understand that we can actually talk about these things. We don't have to pretend they don't exist. Uh, we can actually make them better and we can actually do something about it. So counteract. Uh, expect and encourage full team participation in meetings. Don't be afraid to call on people, but don't try to embarrass them. Interrupt the interrupters. Interrupting is okay to a certain perspective, but when you find that those interruptions are targeting certain populations or maybe the out groups and are being perpetrated by the in groups, it is time to put a stop to it. It is a time to interrupt it and, uh, and just say, hey, Eric, can you stop for a minute? I think Abby was still finishing, right? You don't have to be rude about it, but you can just kind of call it out. Uh, and then assign credit accurately and thoughtfully. Don't um, you know, if you find that if there was a situation where um, yeah, Abby came up with a great idea, it was ignored and people just kept talking, and then er Eric repeated it a minute later, be the person who says, when everyone in the room says, oh, great idea, Eric, then be the person who said, that is a great idea to Eric and Abby, right? I mean, acknowledge that Abby had that idea too, right? It's, it's minor, it's small, it doesn't take much time, but it does take thoughtfulness. Um, review your cycles for what bias might exist, right? In hiring and promotions and assigning projects and feedback and, and terminations. Do you find that when you're giving written feedback to women, you're using more words like too aggressive or too emotional? Um, and when you write reviews for your male teammates, you're writing feedback or reviews that are much more focused on tasks and abilities. So be, be aware of those and, and be careful and try not to do that. And it's interesting to me even just to go back and look at feedback you've written over the last couple of years and see if there is a trend for you that you, that you need to be cor correcting. Try to get exposure to the groups that you might have bias against and get some positive examples to counter the stereotypes you might be hearing. I grew up in a very backward small town and my parents were very slow to accept um, marriage equality. And we used to get in some fights because I lived in the Bay Area and I accepted it 100%. And I didn't understand why they were voting against it. Don't mean to get political here. But then the world opened up before them. They got more exposure. I introduced them to a lot of my wonderful friends. And then those stereotypes that had embedded for them got dispelled. And it didn't take long for them completely to change their thought process once they got some of that exposure. And so join the LGBTQ group on Slack if you feel like you might have biases against that group. Reach out to more women and maybe go to some women's meetings that are appropriate if you feel like you have bias there. Um, ask to be involved if you think those exposures help you and, and, and get that exposure. And, and to this next point, be an ally, right? You don't have to be part of a group to be an ally for that group. And so don't, don't be afraid to be an ally. The, when the first person, one of the first people to join the Slack channel for women when I set it up was Ernst, which was awesome, right? He wants to be an ally for that group. And so he immediately joined and, and that's great. 
prioritize ways you can commit to increasing diversity and building a more inclusive environment. Uh, we will be doing that as a company, but you can do it on your teams as well. And then set an expectation for all employees that you will be creating an environment where employees can surface concerns, right? We don't have to pretend we don't see it. We don't have to pretend it doesn't exist. It's a safe place to raise your hand and say, I am worried about this. I see this happening. Should we do something about it? And, uh, and make sure they know that they can absolutely feel comfortable coming to you or the people ops team with any concerns they have. They should be able to come to anyone in leadership or anyone in people ops to voice those concerns and have that be a safe environment to do so. So questions and ideas. I was just gonna ask a quick question. Can we, for the channels that it applies to, not for like F underscore portfolio management, but for the ch channels like um, like the inclusive channel, can we announce those on the general channel? Because a lot of them I don't hear about and I feel like they, the people who do hear about it are, other people who it applies to, or, you know, somehow it just like, it, it goes over my head or something like that. I miss a lot I, of these yeah. groups somehow. I think we could, does anyone have any objections to that? We document those in the handbook. Yeah, we, we are oh, documenting the handbook, handbook. yes. Oh, yeah. okay. um, when we create them, we, we put them in, in the handbook, but, uh, but um, the, I'm not opposed to the general channel. I'm kind of, I am biased towards trying to keep the general channel as clean as possible on, on, relevant announcements for the whole company but if if there's not concerns around that it's certainly something we can do and the other question i had um is do you think it's crazy to document some of the hiring uh or the apply people who are applying to see what our biases actually are because i feel like right now I, I mean we could take the test and everything could we see like who's applying and who we're hiring to see if we act like what are what are we doing so, so tracking the, the, the profiles of the candidates applying and seeing if there could, if we're not interviewing people of a certain group and that, or we're not hiring people of a certain group, then we probably aren't being, then we might have biases we're not aware of. Yeah. Or to at least like get insight into our potential biases. Uh, yeah, I think we could. I think um, I have to see, I have to check in lever and see what is marked in there. I know that when, when I look at a candidate in lever, I can see their name, but otherwise I would have no clue um, what their background is unless I looked up their picture in LinkedIn or something. Um, yeah. So um, we'll look into that because I know that you could you can ask for that information at application, but there's pros and cons to those things too. But it's an idea, so we'll think about it. Cool. I'm trying to figure out how I go back in and sh stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Sorry, um, I can't see any comments. So if people are writing comments, I don't, I'm not seeing those. Okay, we've got them now, I figured it out. Okay, a lot of people come up to me after my talk. One is doing a screen call. He did say that his English worried him. He spoke very well, okay. Any questions? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Um, I just have a question. Um, well, is it a question? It's more of a comment, I suppose. But something that I'm interested in is because we have our we have our GitLab culture and our handbook and the way that we do things and we we document that. How do we really embrace the diversity of people's ideas? in conjunction with the GitLab workflow and how we do things? Can you, can you repeat that, Abby? How yeah, do we... I, guess I, I guess it's a difficult one. I guess I'm just thinking about how we, we have the GitLab workflow and we're very clear on how we want people to use GitLab and how they should communicate and we have the handbook, etc. How does, how do we then interject or add to that people's different ideas and, and opinions into that when our culture is very well defined and you know we have our general guidelines and, and things like that how do we do that i don't know sid you have a comment on this i find it usually happens more in issues because then pe the discussion happens in the issue and there's a lot of good comments in there but i don't know 
I don't think I'm the biggest expert in the GitLab workflow at this point. I'm trying. Sorry, because this was a repetition of what we did to, during the executive meeting. I was kind of zoned out. What was the question? Um, anyone can answer if they heard it. It's, it's, it's how do we make sure that when we're merging something into the handbook or into the site, and correct me if I'm characterizing this wrong, Abby, how do we make sure that we're hearing the ideas and different opinions uh, when we do that instead of it just instead of it just going out by one person and one person's thoughts? Yeah, that's really hard um, because because you can't have the whole company see everything because the whole company would get uh, bored with it. Um, I try to. The important thing is to find people that are interested. I try to put things in the CEO channel if I have things so people can comment on it. Uh, um, you, you tend to like mention people that have, have commented about this before, but of course that's a self-reinforcing behavior. So you're not getting a diverse viewpoint. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's a good question. I don't have a, have a good answer to it. We could, we could have like a, a handbook uh, Slack channel where it's easier to kind of propose things. What do people think about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk about it too. And I, I think that issues are good. And I think feeding off of, Sid, Sid gave me an idea there. When there are issues I find in when I post them, it seems to be some of the same people commenting. So if you're one of those people, why don't you try to just tag a colleague to say interested in your opinion? Um, and why don't we try to start really farming for more opinions and farming for dissent and farming for other perspectives? Um, we might have strong ones ourselves, but it doesn't mean we can't really reach out to others to try to get theirs as well. Makes sense. Tag a, tag a, a, a random colleague, our team member. Mm -hmm. um, I also created the handbook, uh, um, Slack channel and I'll announce so in uh, general so people can join it if they if you want to be involved. Okay, great. Well, we're out of town, everybody, out of time, everybody. Thank you for participating and feel free to reach out to me or anyone on the team if you have any comments, suggestions, concerns. Thank you.